Okay, so we have understood some of the properties of a gyroscope by looking at the vector character of angular momentum and torque. And if the gyroscope is not spinning, it falls. If it is spinning, it can't fall because falling would imply a sudden change in its angular momentum. And the only thing that changes angular momentum is torque. So it can't just fall and it has to therefore precess around. So the Earth, um, it's not as obese as the typical American, but it does spin and gets kind of little love handles around the equator. So, no seriously. Uh, so omega indicates the spin axis of the Earth. And perpendicular, so this would be the equator here, and, and the Earth is a little bit, actually pear-shaped, but anyway, swollen near the waist, as though we move some mass from the poles down to the equatorial region. Okay? And I want to imagine the consequence of this on the motion of the Earth caused by the gravitational attraction to the sun. So what do we know about the gravitational attraction if the Earth were perfectly spherical? If it were perfectly spherical and it had the same density at every depth. It doesn't have to have, it can be more dense in the core with an iron core, but at any given radius, if it's a uniform density shell at that radius, then Newton showed, and we argued very early in the semester, that outside it gravitates as though all the mass were concentrated at the center of mass. Inside, what happens? There's no gravity but we won't be going inside. So if we were to imagine the Earth as a perfectly round sphere with then some extra appendages, so negative mass at the poles, positive mass at the equator, and we now look at the attraction to the sun, which is far away over here, which would be stronger, F1 or F2? So F1 would be slightly stronger than F2. So what? What consequence does that have? Which way? So what would be the net torque on this simplified approximation to the Earth? It would go in, yeah, give me a letter. Do I have this one as a concept test? I don't think so. Goes in Y? Y. Well, about the center of mass here, then the radius going out and then to that F1 would be into the screen, which is Y. And from F2, it would be going out and then in, so it would be out, opposite. So if F2 magnitude were the same as F1 magnitude, then there would be no net torque. But because gravity falls off like one over the distance squared, and this bulge is a little nearer the sun than that bulge, the torque from this one is a little bit bigger in magnitude than the torque from that one. And therefore there's a net torque in the y direction. Is that correct? Positive y direction. So what will that do to the motion of the Earth? Well, wait a second. Maybe it's all going to fix itself and reverse. At other times of the year, the sun is going to be over here on the other side. Is that going to change 
the direction of the torque and fix everything? Or is that going to just keep producing a torque in the same way? So if the sun were over here, then this one would be bigger, that one would be smaller, right? And what's the direction of the net torque? In. Still in. So it doesn't matter. As the Earth is going around the Sun, it's always getting a torque oriented in the same direction. And at the moment that we're indicating here, that direction would be in the Y direction. So the spin axis of the Earth would have to move in the Y direction. I already did that. And, and that means, just as we've seen for other gyroscopes, that the direction of spin will wander around and precess about, what is that dashed line? That is the plane of uh, the orbit of the Earth around the sun. So the, the force. F, the forces F1 and F2 are directed basically in the plane of the Earth orbit because the sun is sitting over there. And, and the torque caused by this asymmetry will cause the spin axis of the Earth to rotate around. And the time scale for that is about 26,000 years. At the moment, the Earth uh, spin axis points to a star or a very near a star called Polaris. But as you will see in the homework problem, later on it's going to be fairly far away from pointing to that star because it will wobble around. Not in your lifetime unless technology improves. <clears throat> so what consequence does this have on, well, I want to worry about climate. So there's a few, there's way too much going on in this, but it was lovingly stolen from Scientific American, uh, and the reference is there. Um, the Earth orbit, so the Earth axis is tipped at about 23 and a half degrees with respect to the plane of the orbit. And the Sun, as you'll notice, is not really exactly in the center of the orbit which just means that we have a somewhat eccentric. We are in an elliptical orbit, not just a perfect circle. Okay, so that means in, in, at some points in the Earth's history, the northern hemisphere is closer to the sun in the summertime and farther away in the wintertime. And then if we wait, 11 to 13,000 years, it will be reversed. Okay, here's the sun off center, and at this position, the northern hemisphere in the summer, it's tipped towards the sun in the northern hemisphere, and, and it's farther away from the sun. So what would be a consequence of that? So, well, you still have, every year, you have four seasons. You still have winter and spring, summer, and fall. You're on the opposite side of the sun when these things happen, right? But why would that matter? Yeah. Because the orbit of the Earth around the sun is not a perfect circle. Right. If we are tilted one way. Yeah. Right. Our summer, so we get a more like a hotter summer, and conversely, a colder winter. Whereas in the picture on the right, we are at aphelion during our summer, so we have more moderate summers and thus more moderate winters. Okay, that was very nicely put. Let me try to repeat in case you didn't hear. So in this picture, we would have because we're closer to the sun, we would have a more intense heating in the summertime. 
And then when we're at a greater remove from the sun during the, uh, at this part of the orbit and it's winter, we would have less insulation. And so we would have a colder winter. So a warmer summer, colder winter. Whereas here it would be more balanced out, right? So in the uh, summertime, we're farther away. So we get more hours of sunlight, but the intensity of the sunlight's reduced because we're farther away and vice versa over here. So why would that matter? That isn't just going to average out. Why would that have an impact on climate? And it turns out and that this make, I don't know if they teach this um, in, in the high schools, but there's more land in the Northern hemisphere than the Southern hemisphere. Yeah, it, it, just, it's, it happened last year. They, they moved all the land. And, <laughs> and, and I, I don't know if you were noticing. But anyway, so there's a lot more of the land mass in the northern hemisphere than the southern hemisphere. So there it goes. You know, proof positive that what? Uh, so ice ages happen when enough snow falls in the northern hemisphere or more snow falls and becomes a nice white reflective surface then melts back in the summer. So if you have a uh, mild summer, you may not melt away all the accumulation of white stuff that got deposited in the previous winter. Then, because snow and ice reflect the sunlight more effectively than brown land or green plants, more light never makes it to warm the earth. It's just reflected away. And that tends to make more ice. Oh, grand. Oh, grand. Exactly. And so what you're seeing in these spikes is points when we tip into an ice age because the changing patterns in the orbit knock the uh, amount of sunlight needed to melt away the last year's accumulation. And we've spent most of the time in the last four cycles in ice ages. We happen to be currently at a time when two things are true. The eccentricity of Earth orbit is fairly small now at about, uh, where is Anne? About 1.7%? Is that right? The eccentricity of Earth orbit? Even smaller than that. Even smaller than that? Um, it tends to wobble between 0 and 6. 0.06. Not 6. We're not yet hyperbolic. Between 0. <laughs> between zero and 0.06. So, well, let's just estimate. Suppose that, suppose that we were at a time in the Earth's history when the eccentricity of Earth orbit was 5%. How much more intense would the sunlight be at perihelion than if we were in a circle? Take two minutes and make an estimate. So I will repeat the question. Pretend that at the moment we're almost in a circular orbit. So there's no great difference between the distance between us and the sun at any time of the year. It turns out that as the shape of the orbit changes, the semi-major axis doesn't change appreciably. Okay, so as the eccentricity grows up and then diminishes, the length of the semi-major axis remains approximately unchanged. So if we had an eccentricity of 5%, how much more sunlight would we get in one of those intense summers when we're tipped at perihelion so that the northern hemisphere was near the sun? Let me remind you of things elliptical. What is the definition of eccentricity? Well, 
What's this distance? Semi major axis A. Okay, we'll put the sun there. Where's the eccentricity? So this distance is the eccentricity times A. This would be perihelion, this would be aphelion. Okay, so if the length A isn't changing, but we manage to move ourselves at a different time in our past to a region where the eccentricity were 0 0.05, how much more intense would the sunlight be at perihelion? This you can do in your head, I hope. How much? Ian says, how would I know? And then he says, 0.05? Anybody else have a theory? Yeah? 1 over 0.95 squared. 1 over 0.95 squared. How did you get that? So he says that the power in the sunlight per unit area of surface falls off like one over the distance squared that you are from the sun. 